In 1920, 14% of all landowning U.S. farmers were black. Today, less than 2% of farms are controlled by black people, a loss of over 14 million acres and the result of both discrimination and dispossession. Now, while farm management is among the whitest of professions, farm labor is predominantly black and, and brown and exploited. People of color disproportionately live in what's been misnamed food deserts and what Leah calls food apartheid neighborhoods and suffer from diet-related illness. The system is built upon stolen land and stolen labor it's perpetuating disease and inequity, as well as climate disruption and soil degradation, and is overdue for a massive redesign. Enter Leah Penniman, who is a black Creole farmer, mother, and the co-founder and co-executive director of Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York, which is a people of color led project that works toward food and land justice. Creole, by the way, is one of Haiti's two major languages, spoken by over 7 million people, and it combines French, English, Spanish, Taino, and West African languages. Leah is an award-winning food justice activist who's been tending the soil and organizing for an anti-racist food system for over 20 years. She is the author of Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land. She is also a Vaudun Manier, which means she's what's known as a queen mother in the Vaudun spiritual tradition, all of which helps me to understand perhaps why she's quite so lit up. It's a great honor to welcome Leah Penniman to Bioneers. Leah. Greetings, my name is Leah Penniman and I am the co-director and farm manager at Soul Fire Farm in occupied Mohican territory, Grafton, New York, and the author of Farming While Black. My pronouns are Li, she, and Eye, and I am of Dahomey African, indigenous Taino, and European descent. I am honored to talk with you today about our troubled history and relationship to food and land and what we're doing to make that more racially just and environmentally sustainable. Our ancestral grandmothers in West Africa braided seeds of okra, molokia, and Levant cotton into their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships. They hid sesame, black-eyed pea, rice, and melon seed in their locks. They stashed away Amara kale, gourd, sorrel, basil, tamarind, and cola in their tresses. The seed was their most precious legacy, and they believed against odds in a future of tilling and reaping the earth. They believed that their descendants, us, that we would exist to inherit that seed and honor its gift. With the seed, our grandmothers also braided their ecosystemic and cultural knowledge. They braided the wisdom of sharing the land, such as the Husa farm co-op system of the Krobo people. They braided the wisdom of sharing labor and wealth, such as the Dokpue worker co-ops and the Susu credit unions of the Dahomey people. They braided the wisdom of caring for sacred earth, such as the dark earth compost of Ghana, the raised beds of the Ovambo people and the polycultures of Nigeria. But when our ancestors arrived on this continent, they tragically encountered a very different system of relating to land and food. Here, the land was not shared, but stolen and privatized. Authorized by the white Christian doctrine of discovery, settlers perpetuated genocide against indigenous people, murdering millions of human beings, displacing those who survived and stealing their land. Our African ancestors learned that even when they tried to own land, they were punished. Despite the broken promise of 40 acres and a mule after emancipation, black farmers purchased nearly 20 million acres of land, almost all of which is now gone, in part because the Klan, the White Caps, and other white supremacist groups lynched black landowners for the audacity of leaving the plantation, killing over 4,000 whose names we know. Our ancestors learned that even the federal government did not want them to own 
or be secure on land. The U.S. Department of Agriculture systematically discriminated against black farmers, leading to foreclosures and evictions which brings us to where we are today with approximately 95% of the agricultural acres in this country being white owned. Here in this country, our ancestors found that labor was not honored but exploited. Millions of agricultural experts were kidnapped from their homes across Africa, forced into bondage to build the wealth of this nation. And even after chattel slavery officially ended, the exploitation of labor morphed into new forms such as convict leasing. Southerners created new laws called the Black Codes, which criminalized loitering and unemployment, filling the prisons with Black people who were rented back to the plantation, a system that continues to this day. Those not forced onto the plantation through incarceration were often trapped there as sharecroppers in a perpetual cycle of debt and poverty. Even today, farm workers are not protected by basic labor laws and do not have the right to a day off overtime pay, collective bargaining, or other basic protections. Approximately 85% of farm labor is performed by people of color, often undocumented. And today being a farm owner and manager is one of the whitest professions in the US while being a farm laborer is among the brownest. Our ancestors learned that the food system here was not about honoring the earth, rather about extracting her resources. Industrial agriculture had burned up 50% of the soil carbon, catalyzing climate change and devastating biodiversity. But despite the heartbreak and terror that they experienced, there were those in every generation who remembered the seeds they had inherited and the wisdom carried in those seeds. Cooperative land ownership and cooperative labor were remembered by Fannie Lou Hamer in creating Freedom Farm in Mississippi with other sharecroppers, and by the Sharads in creating the first ever community land trust in Georgia. Right relationship with land was remembered by Dr. George Washington Carver, one of the founders of regenerative and organic agriculture, and Booker T. Watley, one of the progenitors of the farm to table movement and diversified small farms. Carver spread the word about caring for soil and community through the first extension agency out of Tuskegee University, inspiring a whole generation of organic farmers in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Right relationship in our human communities was remembered by the Black Panther Party who fed 20,000 children free breakfast every morning, catalyzing the public school food programs, and by the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, the National Black Farmers Association, Land Loss Prevention Project, and more, who fought for the rights of black farmers and farm workers who were struggling to save their land. When I started farming over 24 years ago, I began to wonder how I could honor the legacy of the seeds braided into my ancestors' hair. I wondered if I could help create a farm based on the wisdom carried in those seeds. In 2010, Soulfire Farm was born with a mission to reclaim our ancestral belonging to the lands and to end racism and exploitation in the food system. Once a small family farm and now a community organization committed to this systemic and ancestral change, we pray that the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts and the work of our hands be acceptable to our grandmothers who passed us these seeds. Together, our team is regenerating 80 acres of land through Afro-Indigenous farming and forestry practices. We have restored the soil to its pre-colonial levels of organic matter and increased native biodiversity. Together, we are sharing the harvest of the land at no cost to the doorsteps of people impacted by state violence and supporting families in building their own self-sufficiency gardens. Neighbors around us are pitching in to cover the cost of these vegetable deliveries to those in need, allowing hundreds to receive a weekly share of fresh food and localized small food systems showing their ability to adapt in times of pandemic to keep our people fed. Together, we are equipping the next generation of black and brown farmers through training, mentorships, and connection to resources. Thousands of returning generation farmers and food justice activists have come through our program from over 35 states and three countries, the majority of whom are making waves in the food system 
And for the first time in decades, we're seeing the slightest increase in the number of black farmers nationally in the census. Together, we are using land as a tool to heal from the trauma of centuries of land-based oppression. Our alumni and partners catalyze a new land trust in the Northeast to share land back with indigenous people and with others who've been dispossessed over generations. They catalyze a reparations map to return stolen wealth to earth stewards for their crucial work. Together, we are creating natural buildings using straw bale, solar, cob, cluster development, and energy efficient design to reduce our human footprint on this sacred lands. And we are holding this land cooperatively in a housing co-op, giving nature rights and a vote on the council and returning land rights to the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohican Nation through a cultural respect easement. And we at Soul Fire Farm are not alone. We are one in a great number. And our work would amount to little without the Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, D-Town Farm, East New York Farms, Land Loss Prevention Project, Soil Generation, Urban Growers Collective, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, the Heal Food Alliance, the Black Church Food Security Network, and all of the Black and Indigenous Earth Stewards who are keeping our agrarian traditions alive and addressing the root cause of exploitation of the earth and those who tend and care for her. Together, we are changing the national conversation about food and land. And folks are finally listening. From elected officials to major media outlets, society is waking up to the fact that we cannot have a healthy food system if we ignore racial justice and if we ignore the well being of the land. We are in an uprising and a portal to something ancient and new. But the question is are you willing to carry on the seeds of sovereignty? and fight for the rights of all peoples to carry on those seeds, or will you let them die out? Beyond the great unraveling, what will you do to weave a world anew? My daughter Nishima says the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto your plates, from land to labor to capital to ecology to the food itself. And the good news was such a vast and multifaceted system is that there are many points of intervention and something we all can do. For some of us, the right answer is reparations, returning what was stolen. For some of us, it's rematriation, giving the land back to indigenous people on their own terms. For others, we need to focus on policy that addresses farm worker rights, black farmer dignity and land access and restoration of ecosystems. For others with purchasing power, maybe it's about sourcing from BIPOC producers. But for all of us, when we think about solutions to a racially just food system, we need to ask ourselves, will this action transfer power, resources, and dignity to Black, Indigenous, and other people of color? There is a beautiful story from the sacred literature of the Yoruba people from the Oduifa, which speaks about two friends, Arumila and Osain. Osain owed Arumila some money and they agreed to work off the debt through a labor exchange. And so they went to Arumila's farm and Arumila instructed Osain to please hoe all of the useless, unnecessary and unsightly weeds to prepare for the planting of the crop. Arumila left Osain to the work with an intention to return in six or seven days. And so with hoe in hand, Osain looked left, right, forward, back and came upon a leaf and said, ah, but this leaf is not useless. This leaf here is the leaf of prosperity. Let me walk a little more. And came upon another plant and said, oh, this leaf is not useless. This is the leaf that brings love. And so walked a little further and next saw the leaf that cures stomach ache and then the leaf that cures headache and then the leaf for fertility and the leaf for anxiety and the leaves that went on and on that brought all types of healing that the human beings needed. After six days, Arumila came back and was frustrated and said to Osain, what have you done with all this time? I see that you haven't hoed a single leaf. But with palm over face, with tears in his eyes, Osain said, there is no leaf here that is useless. They are all precious to me and they are all precious to us. There is not one that I can destroy. 
and they realized together that they would have more blessing and more prosperity in their lives if they honored these leaves, if they shared them as a healing blessing with community rather than wiping them out. And so this is our work, I think, is to re-enter into kinship with these plants and animal and soil beings rather than trying to have dominion over them and eliminate them. In closing, Pablo Neruda said, pardon me if when I want to tell the story of my life, it's the land I talk about. This is the land. It grows in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. Thank you.